Well, as George says, this is really an, an, an act of, of piety for Joseph, of whom I was very fond uh, and for whom I have huge admiration. He was, in his time, one of the best-known clergy in the Church of England, uh, and he was certainly one of the most interesting. I was curate of Hampstead Parish Church from 1963 to 1969, when Joseph was busy getting this church rebuilt. There were no services on a Sunday, so every Sunday he preached at Hampstead Parish Church. And therefore, for six years, I sat at his feet, and I got to know him, I think, very well. More of that later. He was born uh, in 1908 in a working-class area of Liverpool. He attended an Anglo-Catholic church, and for, as for so many working-class people at that time, Anglican Catholic worship was a way into a wider world, a world of wonder, of glory, of educational opportunities. And interestingly, as Joseph says uh, in his biography, it gave him a feeling of lineage, of heritage in a class-ridden society. I think that's an extremely interesting, perceptive remark that I've never come across from anybody else uh, before. He won a scholarship to Exeter College, Oxford. He didn't do very well, and I'm not surprised because he wouldn't have been content with an ordinary, narrow academic syllabus. His mind would have ranged wide and far and creatively. He went up thinking he'd like to be ordained, uh, but the more he saw of ordinance in Oxford, the less he relished the prospect of having what he called a clerical persona. And he was very dubious about it indeed. Until H.D.A. Major, who was a good scholar and the principal of Ripon Hall, a training college for the Church of England, took Joseph under his wing uh, and persuaded him to be ordained. H.D.A. Major was the leading advocate in the Church of England of modernism, or what we might call liberalism or radicalism. Um, Joseph, for good and ill, probably for ill, managed to escape going to a theological college himself. He went, which would be impossible today. He somehow slid straight from Oxford to the Liverpool diocese where he was ordained. Whilst he was a curate, he wrote a novel. Unfortunately, some people recognized that in the novel, the main characters seem to be only very thinly disguised people in the parish. <laughs> this was leaked to the national press. There was a great headlines in the papers, uh, and Joseph did a bunk. So he remembers getting away and hiding away in Oxford and reading the Sunday papers and seeing the headlines of a national hue and cry for this young clergyman who had disappeared. Well, as always in Joseph's life, uh, there were wise elder clergy who saw that he had something the Church of England really needed, and persuaded Joseph to stay in the ministry, and sent him to work as a curate under a man called Gillingham, E. F. H. Gillingham, who was the David Shepherd of his day. He was a brilliant cricketer, he played for England. He was a highly successful evangelical clergyman of the very best kind. And Joseph was happy in that parish, indeed so happy he became engaged to Betty, the vicar's daughter. But a very beautiful lady, 
who was training at that time to be uh, an actress and certainly was very much a force in her own right and very much a feature uh, of the dialogues here at St. Mary Le Beau. Now the churches, the church uh, that Vic Gillingham was the vicar of was absolutely packed out. They had to have four settings for Matins and three or four settings for even a highly successful church. But Joseph felt that this wasn't quite the church of the New Testament. He talked about, about there didn't seem to be what he called at that time any kind of co coherence, any kind of real building of community, any kind of real relationships between the par parishioners. And one of the fundamental features of Joseph's whole life uh, was his dissatisfaction with the church as compared to the church of the New Testament and his desire to change it uh, and make it more like his ideal church. Well, he got married and he couldn't stay in the parish as a married clergy, clergyman, uh, so he went for a time, short time to be uh, a curate at St. John Smith Square, and then he went to be rector of Tur Weston in North Buckinghamshire in the Diocese of Oxford. It was very much an upstairs, downstairs life. We're talking about the 1930s. Just look at how different it was. There were ten, just 10 large houses in the village. The average income in each of those houses was at least 10,000 pounds a year, huge sum in those days. All the villagers were employed as grooms and housemaids, and so on, because what the people in the ten houses did was hunt. That was what they were there to do, uh, to hunt. And they earned 31 shillings and sixpence a week. Joseph, as the rector of this parish, earned 289 pounds a year, out of which he had to maintain an absolutely vast house. But he was happy enough there, but again you can see that it didn't exactly serve to reinforce any good understanding of what he felt the church should be, a true community, a community of equals. Then he was offered a rather better living at Great Worley uh, in Essex in 1938, but again uh, he was perplexed by the huge class divide there was in England at that time, and in particular by the fact uh, that the clergy, even though he himself became from a working class family, were always classed with the uppers. It was then that he really started broadcasting. He was in on the early days of broadcasting, and I can remember him telling me at one time uh, that uh, one local landowner who had a horse and carriage, I don't know why they didn't have a car, but anyway, he'd be driven to the station in a horse and carriage and up to the train to London where he'd go into Broadcasting House in Langham Place and deliver one of the early religious broadcasts. The war came. Interestingly, for whatever reason, no serious reason, Joseph was banned from broadcasting for uh, a little bit. And this was also the time that he started to write his books. And if I give you the titles of them, you'll see the kind of person he was uh, and the kind of impact he wanted to make on the church to make it. They were called A Parson in Revolt, A Faith That Must Offend, We Have Our Orders, and The Trumpet Shall Sound. So he was doing a lot of broadcasting, a lot of writing at that period in the 1940s, and he was very well known indeed. And then he felt that what he really needed to do was to go to a major challenge. Uh, and he found his major challenge at St. Mary's Chatham. He turned up on this first Sunday with Betty, and he found that he and his wife were the only people in the congregation. And he knew, as he said, he had found what he wanted. 
He said the problem with most churches is that they're only dying. He wanted a church that was truly dead, and now <laughs> he'd found a church which was truly dead, and he could start again. And where he started again was not in the church, but in the vicarage. He used to invite all manner of people in the vicarage to time to create some kind of community with lively discussion, mutual support, and some kind of prayer and worship. Didn't neglect the work, what went on in the church because that also eventually revived. But what is interesting about that period, amongst the number of young people he drew to that circle in the vicarage was a man called John Wren Lewis. Uh, and anybody who was around in the 1960s and re read John Robinson's book, uh, what was it called now? <laughs> uh, hmm? Honest to God, uh, will we'll remember um, that uh, one of the big kind of influences at that time on John Robinson, who, Robinson was quoted at that time, was a young man called John Wren Lewis, a scientist who'd been very influenced by uh, Joseph. So he accepted that major challenge, and I think it would be true to say that it, it went, uh, went well. He then realized that he wanted something different, and he did go to something different. He went to a beautiful church, the Central Paris Church at Warwick, St. Mary's Warwick in 1949 had the church totally redone and reordered along the lines of the liturgical movement, which George has mentioned uh, earlier on. Now, what is interesting about Joseph uh, is that he was totally committed to the principles of the liturgical movement, that is, the altar brought forward, so there was much more of a sense of, uh, of community, not just the priest with his back to the people, uh, but people gathered around the, the, the altar. Uh, but he was absolutely committed to the language of the prayer book and the language of the authorized version, and he remained with that commitment to the end of his days. So at, at St. Mary's Wallach in 1949 onwards, he was right in the front of the liturgical movement, reordering the worship of the church to make it really beautiful, much more meaningful for people, but still using the language of the prayer book uh, and the authorized version. You may possibly know that he was so keen on the authorized version, but he felt it was too long. So he did uh, a much shorter version uh, of it, getting out of the authorized version what he thought were the actual essentials uh, for uh, people. Uh, and then, 10 years later, in 1959, uh, as uh, you know as well as I do, uh, that he came uh, here. He traveled the world to raise money for the rebuilding of this church, uh, and as George has said, he had two pulpits put in it. Uh, when I knew him, he was quite clear about the rationale uh, of the two pulpits. It was that the church could no longer preach to the world. The church had to engage with the world on an equal basis in conversation. That was his rationale, as I heard it in the 1960s. And of course, in the early church, you would have had a pulpit and amber. They wouldn't have been the same size. What is distinctive about this, these are two pulpits of equal size and of equal importance. And it was absolutely fundamental to him uh, that the church and the world now engaged in dialogue on an equal basis. And so, as you know, uh, they had these very famous dialogues with the intellectual celebrities of the day, Bernard Levin, Joan Bakewell, and, and so on, which uh, were very hugely stimulating, packed out, uh, after, after which they went up uh, to the little flat uh, where they had a long, boozy lunch. Um, I remember Robert Stopford, the Bishop of London at the time, who had a wonderfully dry sense of humor. There, George is pointing up there. Robert Stopford, the Bishop of London at the time, who had a wonderful dry sense of humor. 
Uh, he said about Joseph and his ministry here, our one link with the outside world. I'll tell you another funny story about this wonderful... The, um, Robert Stopford had been the headmaster of a public school, and as you probably know, Geoffrey Fisher at the time had been headmaster uh, of Rat Repton, and he, he was, his whole approach to the church was as a headmaster. And Robert Stopford, I remember, once told me that all the bishops were gathered together listening to Geoffrey Fisher, and he, Robert Stopford, put up his hand and said, excuse me, Archbishop, we're all headmasters now. <laughs> so, um, Joseph had this very successful ministry here, but I knew him uh, in Hampstead. And I would have to say, he is consistently the best preacher I've ever heard. He was, I've heard many good preachers in my time, but he was a consistently brilliant preacher because what he said always struck one as not only interesting, but important. People really did come to hear something. He preached on the main issues of the day in a way which was always arresting and got you to think differently. I remember, for instance, at the height of the satire boom in 1965 or 96, with, you know, that, that was the world that was, the great, the great days of satire. We don't have anything like that now. And Joseph preached a brilliant sermon uh, on how satire was essential to Christianity. Jesus was the greatest satirist that ever lived and all through Christian history. And they ended up at the, at the end by saying, the problem is we don't have any real satire today. Well, what he meant by that, I don't quite know. But anyway, it, you can imagine it was a spellbinding uh, sermon directly addressed to the, something which was very much in the air uh, at, the, uh, at the time. Hampstead Parish Church was very uh, interesting because it had a brilliant choir uh, under Martindale Sidwell, e the equal of any cathedral choir in the country, uh, and half the congregation came to hear the music, and the other half came to hear Joseph preach. Um, matins began uh, at 11 o'clock. There was a communion at 12.15, which Joseph used to take. And if the anthem went on too long, so that Joseph got late in the pulpit, he was not very pleased. And I can honestly remember him at one time when the anthem had been a particularly long piece of Brahms where he said, the name of the Father, the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Because we've had Buggins in H today, you're only going to get 30 seconds from me. Buggins in H was his diatribe for long, long musical <laughs> anthems. Because half the congregation had generally come to hear Joseph preach. Then, as I say, he went on to the 1215 service. If you wanted to see Joseph at his best, it was probably celebrating uh, the Holy Communion according to the Book of Common Prayer at a quiet said service where all the kind of devotional side came out of him. Now, most of his life, as I said, had been a struggle with the church to reform uh, the, the, the church. And he called his biography, My Affair with the Church, and a story he used to love to tell uh, is of a bishop who wrote round his clergy to say, what is the biggest obstacle to your ministry? And one clergyman wrote back to say, my wife, God bless her. Uh, and uh, Joseph said, well, that's how he used to feel about the church. Uh, it was the big, biggest obstacle to his ministry, but God bless her. But in Hampstead, of course, he came to realize the problem was much deeper than that. It wasn't just the church. He began to lose his interest in reforming the church. What he realized uh, is that, in fact, the Christian faith had been a foreign language to people in this country for perhaps a hundred years. And what went on in church was strange, if not alien. So he struggled for a new way of communicating the Christian faith. Uh, and one of his major kind of ways of talking about it was to draw contrast between what he called the clamant ego, 
and the true self. That, I suppose, uh, was one of his major themes at that time. How do we find our true self and get away from uh, the clamant ego? And he was at his very best for the three-hour meditation, which was absolutely packed out at Hampstead Parish Church. He put his whole self into that three-hour meditation. Never followed conventional lines. One year he'd do the seven ages of man according to Shakespeare or whatever it might be. But it nearly always came back to this idea of how we find our, our true self. And he came to this, I think, quite early. I was looking at a pamphlet he wrote in 1950 called What is Man For? And I came across this sentence in it. We are created to realize ourselves and the unfolding of that realization is the part every individual is called upon to play. The self we are called to realize is God in man, Christ. So he wanted to try to desperately, desperately struggling. And this is why, although Joseph was an extraordinary paradox, outwardly he could appear to be an extraordinarily egocentric man. If anybody had a clamant ego, it was Joseph himself. But when he celebrated the Holy Communion uh, or did the three-hour meditation, somehow this other Christ, the other self, this Christ within him came out. And he was that, that extraordinary pari, pa uh, pa paradox and contradiction. Um, but he was why I admire him so, so much is that in the end, he was deeply serious. He was deeply serious, first of, for most of his early part of his life, trying to reform the church, and then in the later part of the church, trying to find a new language to communicate the Christian faith. That is what really mattered uh, to him, and why he was indeed a very great spirit. He did, as a human being, feel frustrated that his gifts were not recognized in the church. They were recognized by some people. William Temple, the great Archbishop of Canterbury, took him under his wing. Joseph was very much a protege of William Temple. And if William Temple hadn't died, Joseph McCulloch would have gone on probably to be Dean of Westminster or Dean of, of St. Paul's. But of course, the clergy didn't like him because uh, you can understand why. Um, and to give you a, a sign of his frustration, his rather human side, nobody else has ever heard this before. He passed to me a, a little limerick, a little poem he had written. Um, it's called The Lament of the Ecclesiastically Unpreferred. <laughs> and the subtitle is, On Hearing That the New Dean of St. Paul's Owes His Appointment to the Express Recommendation of Sir Kenneth Grubb to the Prime Minister. Ah me, ah me, the boots I've licked, mistakenly, ah there's the rub. Of all the names I might have ticked, I never chose Sir Kenneth Grubb. Oh what avail the Athenaeum, I never could afford the sub. <laughs> I might be singing now te deum had I known Sir Kenneth Grubb. <laughs> I could have saved much lucubration and got my learning in a pub had I but realized the nation was mainly run by Sir Kenneth Grubb. <laughs> Why did I mingle with the gaiters, endure the dignitary's hubbub, when all the time personas gratas you pushed along Sir Kenneth Grubb. <laughs> the spreading tree of my preferment shrinks to the stature of a shrub. My hope fit only for interment through ignorance of Kenneth Grubb. <laughs> <laughs> Is it too late? Could I recover momentum in that tedious club? Perhaps some member could uncover just who the hell is Kenneth Grubb? <laughs> Well, apologies to Sir Kenneth Grubb, but he was a leading layman in the Church of England at the time. And you can see, you can, don't need to be very bright to realize that actually Ke Joseph wanted to be Dean of St. Paul's uh, and was deeply disappointed 
that he wasn't even uh, considered. Uh, and he expressed his frustration <laughs> in that brilliant poem. So you can see he was a very human figure, very human figure, but in my mind, to my mind, he was a great spirit that you could ignore the clamant ego. I mean, my typical picture of him is holding forth uh, with a cigarette in his hand. Everybody chokes, chain smoked in those days, including Joseph, but he always had a cigarette a cigarette holder. So he had a long cigarette holder with a cigarette at the end and a glass of wind, wh whiskey in one hand. Him holding forth, everybody sitting around, enthralled. He would be the, the center, center of it. That was, if you like, his clamant ego. But the, the essential part of him was, I believe, the Christ in him, which was deeply serious of trying to communicate the Christian faith uh, to a people that are really had become totally unfamiliar uh, with the language. Over to you. Well, you can sense how that was appreciated. I thought that was absolutely masterly, um, fluent, entertaining, and um, thoroughly, thoroughly interesting, and has reconnected us with a considerable part of our historic tradition. Although before anybody else says it, um, at least one element does survive, and that's the long boozy lunch. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned Henry Major uh, uh, as one of the formational characters, and. Um, uh, uh, I know nothing about Henry Major at all, except that when I was training at Cudston, yes. because they joined with Ripon Hall, there yeah. was a bust of Henry Major, and you could take this bust, it was bronze, you could take it off, there was a sort of nut at the bottom, and you could actually get this off. <laughs> and if somebody was particularly annoying, they would find this in their bed at the end of, <laughs> at the, end of the day. That's all I know about Henry Major. Um, I wonder whether you could just say something about um, Betty, Right. And, and about the, their relationship and the, and the family, because she was clearly a, a significant person around this place. Uh, Betty was a very significant figure, there's no doubt about it, and shared fully uh, in, the, in, the, in the dialogues. Um, I wasn't privy to the nature of their relationship, but I think it was a pretty intense one. Um, and I think it was one of those very honest relationships uh, where they were quite prepared to state their mind to each other. And I believe that they very often used to do this by letters to each other, rather than speaking. I think you, they used to, to communicate a lot by letters to one, an, one another. So my guess is that it would have been quite, my guess, it would have been, uh, it, was a, it was a serious, profound relationship, but it would, I think, also have been a stormy one, because they were both very, very strong characters. Sadly, jo Betty had a terrible stroke, uh, and was uh, towards the end of her life and uh, was, went to a, a, a Roman Catholic home uh, just on the, on near, near, Chiswick, near Chiswick Bridge, which was very, was very, very sad. And, uh, and jo then Joseph was you know, living on, on his own, a bit, a bit isolated. She was a very considerable figure in, in, her, in her own right, and no doubt, you know, no doubt about it. it um, one of their daughters, one of it, their son became... Um, academic mathematician, I think, is in Canada, and the a daughter, um, Jane, uh, was an actress. We, s we see Jane yeah. here from yeah. time to time, and the, um, the, her children occasionally pop in. We've right. seen them from right. time to time. There's some connection. I wonder if there are any, either any questions um, about him or about that period of our history, or indeed whether any of those who remember Joseph McCulloch have anything that they might want to... Um, say or share. We have got a microphone if anybody would like that. But it... Lawrence, do you remember him well? Uh, I don't disagree with anything that's been said. I don't disagree with anything that's been said. But I think the, my s summation of him as a character is what was said at the time. He is, of course, a scholarship boy. And he wore his brilliance very well, but not to everyone's delight. And he would uh, say to us in Great Wally, uh, with great humility, look, will, will, you, will you 
Will you put up with me, please? Because the next few even songs, he said, well, I want to, I want to reorganize them and, and, and put, put over a new form of even song, which is just an experiment, if you would indulge me in that. Oh. And of course we did. And I think uh, he was probably playing for the audience of, of, of Betty as audience, but he, uh, he, was, uh, he, he was very keen. Oh. Thank you. Stick his neck out. To stick his neck out, that's interesting. Yeah. Any other thoughts or recollections? I'm right in saying that the PCC never met, aren't I? So was it once a year, yes. Yes, we've got a full set of, 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 of um, minutes of the annual meeting, but we have absolutely nothing else at all. Which, yeah. 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 Antoine, the church warden, and Luminary himself. Very close to your mouth, if you would. Well, thank you very much for that. I found it really um, uh, fascinating. Your, can, can you hear me? Sorry. I found it really fascinating, the account you gave, so thank you very much for that. I had one question with regard to his, um, his insights about um, the true self and, and um, realizing that. And, and as close as you can to the mic. Sorry, I, I had That's one... It. In here? I, I had one question with regard to his, his insights about the true self, and that is, what were his formative influences? W was it more the sort of platonic tradition, or, or was it some of the, uh, perhaps, uh, um, uh, was it more um, influences from uh, other religious traditions, such as Advaita, or, or what, what had led to that? I need you at the microphone. The question was, uh, what were the main influences uh, in his important stress on the true self? I think the short answer is that it was Jung. Oh. He read quite a lot of, of Jung, clearly. But another very big influence on him was William Blake. Uh, he very often quoted William Blake. Um, and he'd clearly gone through a great Blake phase uh, at one point in his life, but had remained with him. I'm not saying that he was simply, uh, uh, as it were, spouting Jungian solid psychology, not at all, but I think he'd, he had certainly read his Jung, uh, and he thought that the kind of vocabulary which Jung used was, was a useful kind of vocabulary for communicating the Christian faith today. His, his dedication to the prayer book and the authorized version is yeah. very interesting yeah. um, to me. Yeah. Uh, and actually, we've got a, a whole lot boxes of his um, uh, kind of redacted Bible upstairs. And if anybody wants one of those, do please apply to me and go into the roof yourself to get them. Um, but in a sense, that particular tradition of, of 17, 16, 17th century language doesn't really normally go with the liturgical movement. No, it doesn't. And, and I think Gerald Hudson, who succeeded him, yeah. found that quite difficult. No, well, I mean, that's, that's why I stressed it. It is unusual with, with Joseph. He felt, he, he felt that the modern translations didn't, didn't just do justice. But how can you do the prayer book Eucharist across the well, altar? Well, he, he, he somehow, somehow he did it, both at Warwick and, and, and here. I don't right. quite know how, but he... But, he, but somehow he did it. I quite agree. It doesn't. I mean, the nearest to it, of course, is what used to be called series two, or is it? What is it now? Common worship. Yes, B, a or, B, a or, or B, 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 whichever, whichever, it, whichever is. it is. So, I mean, what Joseph was trying to do, which was a a, a, a modern liturgical shape with traditional language, is now available in common worship, the alternative yeah. thing for, for, for common yeah. worship. Though I think he would say that the, that some of that language, which is new. Uh, isn't really up to standard. And of course, I think it, it has to be faced that a lot of... I, I very often tra defend modern translations myself, but one has to... Particularly the biblical, some of the biblical translations are very, very good, but I do think some of our liturgical texts yes. are so kind of, yes. you know, van ordinaire, aren't they? Yeah. Yes, I think that's absolutely <laughs> right. 
of microphones coming to you. Again, thank you very much. The most interesting uh, lecture. I was just wondering, uh, because I, one who's never really uh, known anything about him, tonight is my first introduction to him, so it's quite fascinating. Um, and I, I was, so the first question that comes to mind is that if he was such a controversial figure within the church, um, why, how was it that he managed to get a position in this particular church? Um, the question was, if, if because he was such a controversial figure in the church, how did he manage to get uh, a, a, a position here? First, first of all, he always had some strong backers who kept, every time he was tempted to leave the ministry, who said, you must stay in, Joseph. People, the church needs people like you inside it to criticize him, so criticize the church. So, you know, he did have his backers. Uh, also, the system of patronage in the Church of England, as George will explain to you, is a very strange affair. Um, because in those days, um, it, you, almost anybody could get a, church, a job in the Church of England, uh, however heretical or odd they were, because all sorts of different patrons. And if you agree with Thomas Hobbes uh, that power is that liberty is power cut up into little pieces, the Church of England, uh, even now, but even more then, was power cut up into little pieces. Nobody, nobody was there controlling things. So if you hated your bishop, you could find a private patron to put you in. But no doubt, no, I, but I would have thought uh, that uh, not a lot of people would have wanted to take on, take on a bomb church uh, in the middle of London where there are far too many churches anyway, raise a lot of money for it and rebuild. And that wouldn't have been uh, what a lot of people were hankering after. But Joseph saw here a real challenge, an opportunity to do something fresh. And thank goodness, presumed it was Robert Stockford, was it the Bishop of London at that, uh, at that time? Who, who recognized actually J Joseph did have a kind of streak of genius who could done, do something with this church. Oh. And uh, there may be an element in which, um, rather like when he was at Chatham, he was starting from scratch. Starting, because starting although there was scratch. a congregation here worshiping in a hut outside, yeah. in a sense, there was yeah. nothing here. He liked, the idea of starting, he liked the idea of starting again, yeah. yeah. So that's probably enough. I think yes. people are probably that, enough well, ready, ready for the Well, thank you very much. I think you can <laughs> sense people's appreciation. Thank you. Really excellent.